St. Philip's College is the benefactor of the Living in My Skin collection. This collection will live through history. The ideation has come through four very significant individuals, Lionel and Kathy Sosa, Brandon Logan, and Seymour Battle. My very special thanks to Brandon Logan and Seymour Battle. They served as the executive producers for a documentary of Living in My Skin. The Living in My Skin collection and documentary has caused and created an opportunity for us to mentally weigh, to reflect, and to, and to digest the experiences of African American men and young boys as they share their stories with us. This documentary and portrait collection mixes art with social justice and causes us all to give pause. We are at a critical juncture in our American history. And to quote Lionel Sosa, if you are not actively anti-racist, you are not anti-racist. San Antonio artist Lina Sosa paints portraits of ordinary people and on occasion, famous people. His latest work, Living in My Skin, Black Men Tell Their Stories, consists of 33 all on linen portraits of black men and an accompanying documentary. In 2020, shortly after George Floyd's death, Lionel and his wife Kathy saw a poster that read, you can't be an anti-racist unless you are actively anti-racist. That simple statement inspired them to begin conversations with Brandon Logan and Seymour Battle, both black men who they recently met. Listening to Brandon and Seymour's stories moved the four of them to take action. Lionel spoke with black artists, business executives, clergymen, educators, doctors, and veterans. He spoke with fathers and sons. He filmed their stories and painted their portraits. Those portraits will go on exhibit this semester in the Watson Fine Arts Building. The collection represents a donation of over $200,000 to the college. Living in My Skin is a result of a talented team of creative people and anti-racist activists. The documentary is available on klrn.org and has been added to the college's digital archives. Lionel studied for eight summers with the world-renowned portrait artist Nelson Shanks. Lionel's work has shown at the Whitney Museum in San Antonio and the Heritage Museum in Laredo and hangs in the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library in College Station. A series on Mexican ranchers exhibited at the Briscoe Western Art Museum in January of 2022 as a part of Warner Segada's epic Vaqueros de la Cruz del Diablo show. Other works include Hidden Heroes, The People Who Keep America Working, Life-Size Portraits of Working Latino Men and Women, and a series called El Vercado Real, The Original American Cowboy. Both collections are a part of Texas A&M University San Antonio's permanent collection. I'd like to thank Lionel for returning to St. Philip's College to talk about his work. After sharing his journey, you will see excerpts of the documentary featuring Brandon Logan and Seymour Batter. And I really, really appreciate uh, your welcoming uh, this program, Living in My Skin, which has been something quite important to me. I've been working on it for 
uh, well over a year with my good friends, Brandon Logan and uh, Seymour Battle. And I'm so glad to be here today. Uh, this whole thing started uh, right after George Floyd's death. Uh, and it just happened that that was about the time that all of us were being locked down in, uh, uh, from COVID. So we were all at home. We were watching. Uh, we were watching television. We didn't have much else to do. So we were locked in and saw that video of George Floyd actually dying right in front of us. And I think it affected every American, no matter uh, what our race was. We were all very disturbed by it. We were all very bothered by it. We didn't know exactly what to do. And uh, I uh, saw a post poster right around that time, maybe it might have been a week or two after his death, and the poster was in a little juice bar, and it said, you can't be anti-racist unless you are actively anti-racist. And uh, I thought about that, and I thought it made a lot of sense, and I said to myself, you know, I think I'm anti-racist, but I've never been actively anti-racist in my life. I've never done anything close, even close to that. I've never, I've never participated in any march. I've never uh, had any involvement at all. What could I do to prove uh, this message of this poster being true? And uh, at that time, that very morning, I was having a meeting with Brandon Logan and Seymour Battle. We were doing a real estate transaction uh, on Montana Street and Pine Street on the east side of San Antonio. My wife and I had a property there that we were selling. And uh, during the course of this business transaction, I asked both men uh, about how they felt, about what was going on. And uh, I assumed that uh, there wasn't much of a race problem in San Antonio. After all, uh, San Antonio is 65% uh, Latino. Uh, it's a city that has been uh, in racial harmony for many, many years. And even though the black population of San Antonio is only 7%, uh, we've already had a black woman mayor. Uh, we have the largest MLK march in the country. Uh, so I figured they were going to say, well, you know, it's not so bad here. It's different in San Antonio here. Uh, it, it's understood. It's not like New York or Atlanta or Los Angeles or some other big city. And uh, to my surprise, Brandon answered my question when I said, what's it like for you? He said, let me tell you about the daily challenge of living in my skin. That's the way he answered the question. The daily challenge of living in my skin. I was floored by that because he was so succinct in his answer and yet so compellingly accurate, I thought. And uh, so I said, Brandon, uh, Tell me about that. And he started telling me stories uh, about his childhood, about the everyday life of being a black business person here, about uh, having a nice car and yet being stopped in some neighborhoods because they thought that a black man should not be driving an expensive car in an expensive neighborhood, or being stopped while walking his dog because somebody reported a suspicious character. Uh, and Seymour had several stories as well. So I thought, my God, these, 
who, who do you tell these stories to? And they said, you know, as black men, we have these conversations a lot between ourselves, especially now that uh, the George Floyd video and the conversation about it is so relevant. And uh, so I said, you know, the only thing I do I'm doing right now <clears throat> is painting portraits. What if I were to paint your portrait, both of you guys' portrait, and maybe the portraits of of of, of other <clears throat> of other folks, <clears throat> and we would mount a show, an art show uh, that uh, that just featured black men as San Antonio heroes, uh, and they said. I think that'd be a great idea. Yeah, I think we can do it. And I said, well, what, where would we show it? Where would we, where would we go? What, how would we make it legitimate? Maybe we should associate with a museum. Maybe we should associate with corporations. Might a corporation sponsor this? And they said, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and uh, well, who should we interview? Who should we interview? Who should be? Should we have? Uh, uh, 10 portraits, should we have 20 portraits, should we have 30 portraits, how many portraits we sh should we have, Just as many as you want to paint. Uh, and uh, how, uh, who chooses these, these men? Well, we can figure, uh, we can figure that out. Why don't we uh, try to have a very broad representation of, of people, of black men? Should it be women as well? I said, no, this is an issue about black men today, about how black men are dying and how much of this happens every day, except that somebody happened to videotape this particular one. Because somebody, that young, brave girl, videotaped that death, a modern day lynching, we were able to see what actually happened. And that brought a whole new uh, way of looking at this. Uh, where, and they both said, you know, it happens today as it's always happened and the, and the white cops always go, go free. And uh, we're left uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with this, terrible disgrace of this promise, false promise of equality in America. All men are created equal. That is a false promise today. It has been a false promise since that statement was made. And uh, all of a sudden I realized, you know, we can't capture this just in portraits. We have to capture their stories on video as well. So we started kind of making a list of who should be in it. And we said, well, let's make it a very broad spectrum, spectrum from the very, very uh, uh, highest ranking person uh, in in statue uh, in stature in 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 uh, title uh, whatever it is to to somebody living under a bridge or a homeless person and let's make it uh, in all age ranges from ten years old to ninety years old and let's just have some people that are well known and some people that are not well known and. Uh, they gave me some names and then I started getting calls from people saying, I hear you're working on this. Uh, I, I heard you, you're working on this. Can I help? Uh, in fact, Sawana Baloo was so helpful in this because she said, how can, how can I help you find somebody? I said, well, I need a, I, I need a religious person. I need a 10 year old boy. I need a 14 year old boy. I need a gay man. I need a bra. And she helped us find these people. Of course, Brian and Seymour, because they know so many people, they helped us find people as well. And uh, so they came in 
to my studio. I took their photographs. I started painting their portraits. And then I got a friend of mine uh, who has been my uh, assistant for the last 33 years, Janine Richards. Uh, she's black and she's been my assistant for 33 years. And I realized that I had never had a conversation with her in 33 years specifically about race. We talked about business every day and uh, she helped me put together uh, all of the uh, elements that have to do with running a, a business uh, uh, through the years, but we never talked race. And I said, you know, Janine, it's amazing that we've never talked about race. He says, well, I know you've just never been interested enough to ask. And I realized She's right. You know, I've never been interested enough to ask a black person how they feel about how the world treats them. And I wondered how. And then I started asking my white friends and my Latino friends the same thing. And they all assume, well, San Antonio, <clears throat> we don't have a race problem here. I'm sure that black men here uh, don't feel uh, don't, don't feel the way uh, black men in other cities do. But when, as I started, as I started videotaping these men, uh, I found that uh, some of them uh, uh, actually felt that they were being choked as they were watching this video, especially uh, one man, Mr. Simpson, who is, uh, in fact, the owner of that juice bar that I saw that poster at, uh, he said, as uh, I saw that video, I thought it was me calling for my mom. I felt the breath taking, being taken out of me. Uh, and he said, I could only watch it once and I've never been able to watch it again. Uh, and I asked the young kids about the same thing. I asked came up with a whole bunch of questions and I was interviewing these men and they just got, talked directly to me and we interviewed each one for about an hour or so. And we came up with a documentary and uh, uh, we asked KLRN television if uh, they would be interested in showing it. And thanks uh, with the help of, of Seymour, who was on the board of KLRN, he was able to arrange that. So we got the time to show it. In fact, it's being shown again uh, in Black History Month at KLRN. Uh, and uh, I um, realized that this was stories that needed to be told, but I still had a big, big problem. I'm not Black. What right do I have to be telling this story? What right do I have? And Seymour and, and Brandon said, don't worry about that. In fact, it's better it's, it's not one of us telling the story because it's, if it's a, a Latino or a white person telling the story, it'll be much, it, it'll be more believable and more relevant, which I thought was interesting because I thought, you know, some people might be up in arms saying, this is a black story a black person should be telling and not you, and this is not none of your business. But as you would have it, the world just opened up we were able to get all of these people. We interviewed them. We were able, thanks again to Brandon and Seymour, uh, to, uh, to be able to raise uh, over $200,000 and, uh, and enough money, in fact, to uh, be able to give scholarships to St. Philip's College. I think it was somewhere about $45,000 or so. And we're very, very happy to do that because we actually wound up raising more money than we needed. Uh, but we were able to have uh, uh, the show go all over town. Well, the, the last uh, year uh, and a half, uh, it's been going up. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's been at Valero. It's been with United Way. It's been at the <clears throat> Frost Bank. It's been at schools, the Young Men's Leadership Academy, and on and on and on. The religious, uh, uh, the, the religious uh, community here has taken it on in, in a big, big way. And we've had about a dozen panels or so. So I would say that in the past year, it's been, a, it has raised the awareness of what it's like to be a black man in San Antonio. And hopefully 
uh, people like myself have learned. I know that I have learned so much from this. I had no idea how ignorant I was about race relations. And uh, I uh, think through this process, I got a PhD. Well, maybe I, I have a PhD in race relations, or maybe I'm still in kindergarten. I don't know. But I know that I'm a little bit smarter than I was uh, a year ago when I was working on this, and I've learned to be a much more sensitive person, hopefully. I've never experienced what these men have experienced. As a Latino, uh, some of us uh, feel that we're discriminated against, and, and, and of course, Oh, I have been discriminated against, but never, ever, ever to the point where I have to be afraid of my life if a policeman pulls me over. I've been pulled over many times for speeding and God knows what else, having a, a taillight going or wherever it was, but I stop. The cop comes. I have no fear whatsoever. This guy's not going to take me in. Uh, I... I pull out my driver's license and everything else like that. A young man today, if he is black, fears being pulled over by a cop. He knows the rules because daddies and mamas have told him, you make sure that everything is on the dashboard, your driver's license, your wallet, your, 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 your insurance, and your phone, and that you don't have to reach into your pockets, that you keep your hands on the steering wheel and you are polite to that policeman and you say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and answer all of the questions and be as polite as you can. I never got that conversation from my mom one day. I never had to. Uh, or uh, having been in a store and making sure that I've got my hands out of my pockets or that I have a receipt when I walk out the door. They never had to tell me that. Uh, they never had to tell me, if you see another per a white person coming towards you, go to the other side of the street so that they won't feel intimidated. But a black man, especially if he is big and muscular, and a white person is walking towards them, that white person will always hesitate if it's a woman, or even a man, they'll tend to walk to the other side of the street so they don't have to walk on the same path as that person. Or they will clutch their purse. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's uh, uh, Dr. Kelly tells a story about when he was first in, he's a gynecologist, a very famous and one of the best gynecologists in the world, practicing right here in San Antonio. He had a white nurse when he first started uh, uh, in practice. And uh, so women would come in, make an appointment. They would see a white nurse there. She'd welcome them. She'd go back. They'd open the door. They'd see him. And they'd say, uh, ooh, I, I, I forgot my, my purse. Let, let me go. Or I forgot something in my car. They'd get back in the car. They'd never come in again. And uh, you know, that kind of thing has, has never happened to me. I have felt it, but I have felt talked down to. I have felt like somebody didn't think I was as smart as they were or as educated as they were or whatever, making assumptions based on the color of your skin. And I realized that I have made assumptions during my life based on the color of my skin. I'm 83 years old. Uh, when I was eight years old, <clears throat> our, my mom and dad moved into a neighborhood on the west side that happened to be right next to a black neighborhood uh, on Delgado Street in, uh, in the deep west side, which there's still a black community, a small enclave of a black community. And when my mother found out that there were blacks nearby. She said, we've got to move away. We moved too close to, to black people. Don't, don't play with them. Said, don't play with them? No. Why? Because they're black. So those were the messages that I grew up getting. I was 
here when blacks uh, were forced to uh, ride on the back of the bus. I experienced that. So you go into into a, a bus, you see the black people in the rear of the bus and the white people everywhere else. And well, that's the way it's supposed to be. You assume that things are supposed to be a certain way. And uh, even today, I still slip and make assumptions. Uh, a couple of months ago, I, I usually carry $5 bills in the car because, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, sometimes somebody stops and uh, you stop at a, at a stoplight and somebody's on the street corner asking for a few bucks, especially during COVID. It happened a whole lot more. And I was driving in a little, I have a, 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 a old 1979 Volkswagen bug convertible. Uh, that I've just restored. And I was driving with it with the top down one day on the east side and a black man on the corner goes, uh, stops me. And I assumed because I was on the east side and this black man on the corner stopped me. I assumed that he was asking for money. All he wanted to do is congratulate me on that little car. So that is a fine looking car, man. I'm still making assumptions based on where I am and the color of a person's skin. So those assumptions that we make, even when we are not aware of them, are deep inside us. And we make those decisions. A friend of mine, uh, right after the Super Bowl, said, man, can you believe, Latino, he's a Latino. And he said, there were too many Blacks in the Super Bowl. They were just halftime show with too many Blacks. I felt uncomfortable. I can't relate to them. I said, well, you can relate to all the players. Most of them are Black. What's the difference, you know? But still actually make a statement like that says that we don't understand. We don't understand. I'm in the process of understanding. Uh, and it happens uh, a lot. And it, and it happens maybe once or a month or so where something that happens reminds me that I have a lot to learn. And uh, Maybe other people have a, something to learn, maybe not. But if, this, uh, if these stories open up one mind, open up one heart to understanding how much further we need to go and understanding that we do have uh, a problem with race, even in San Antonio, we feel that we will have been doing a, a, a very good job. I'm a full-time portrait painter, uh, and that's all I do these days. And I love painting portraits because every face is different, and every face is interesting. There isn't a face in the world out there that is not interesting or wants to tell you an interesting story. And capturing that... Uh, mood with your, with the way the eyes are, with the expression of their mouth, with the way they wear their hair or how they dress, or just what their uh, attitude is when that photograph is taken, uh, it is important and tells you much about them. I did a series of uh, Mexican women uh, mostly in Mexico. And these are street vendors. Almost in any city in Mexico, if you go on vacation and you go into the center of town, you'll find these ladies that are making little toys and stuff, and they're selling them. Uh, and uh, so you think of them as vendors. Oh, uh, here they, here's two bucks for this, whatever. whatever they, uh, but when you look deep into their souls, they are 
artists first. They are business women. They are many, many times uh, single moms, uh, and they are the breadwinner. Uh, and they're entrepreneurs. Uh, and if you capture that side of them, and sometimes it's hard to capture because they're so subservient that they that they that they won't even look at you. So you got. You, sometimes I'll say to them, "Okay, I'll give you twenty five dollars. I don't need your dolls, but I would like to get, take your photograph." Uh, will you let me take your photograph? And I give them the equivalent of twenty five dollars in pesos, and they're amazed. But I'll sit with them for maybe 15 minutes and I'll get them. Look, I want a proud pose from you. I want you to feel like the woman you are, an entrepreneur, a businesswoman, a smart, intelligent artist. I want that proud look. I want you to give me a proud look like this. And sometimes it takes them a while. But when I get the look I want, and I'll take maybe 20, 30, 40 pictures until I get just the angle, just the light coming the right way. And when you ask what are the important elements, the first is getting that attitude correct, you know, getting who they are at the deep bottom of their souls. Because if they're not prepared for a picture or what you want from them, you won't get a good picture. You've got to paint a portrait from a good photograph. Uh, and then the next thing is have a good light source. Know where the light is coming from. I use a lot of color in my portraits and people ask me, where do you get that color? And I have found that you can use any color you want wherever you want to use it as long as you get the values of light and dark. I can make the forehead blue, green, yellow, or pink on a black person, if I have the light coming here and that pink or that yellow or that blue is light, and then where the shadows are, that doesn't matter if it's blue or orange or red or pink, as long as it's dark red, dark orange, or, or, or a deep, deep, deep pink. Because if you get the lights and darks correctly, you can have all you, you can experiment with color all day and have a lot of fun. Or you can use very little color. Uh, I don't know if you can see. No, I no, I took it down. I had a portrait that I'm doing. Usually when you see a portrait of Frida Kahlo, uh, the artist that was married to Diego Rivera, you will see, you know, flowers and a lot of color and everything like that. I found a picture of her when she was about 14 or 15 years old, where she's wearing a white shirt and she and a black coat and there's no color. And so I said, oh, I'm going to do a, a, a painting of Frida Kahlo with uh, uh, with no color and, and see what uh, what that looks like. So you can ex experimenting is, is so important, getting a good quality photograph, having a good light source and then getting that expression just right. Those are the key elements. Well, the portrait collection, I have donated it, my wife and I personally, to St. Philip's College. So it will live in St. Philip's College, hopefully for many, many years. But the, all the collection of all the 33 paintings will be there with catalogs, with an explanation of what it is, and with a link to the documentaries. So you can really take in the full experience. Uh, so that will always be there and it will be only at St. Philip's College. I would just really the, like to, to thank all the people that helped me, especially my wife, Kathy, that helps me uh, with, with, uh, with everything that I do. Uh, and uh, to Brandon Logan, and to see more battle, and to Sawana uh, Balu, and to Janine Richards, and all of the people who were involved in making of the of the documentary, uh, and uh, and of course all of our sponsors.
My name is Brandon Logan. I am 35 and I'm a social entrepreneur. Well, you know, living in America as a black man has never been uh, easy. And I think it's important considering the times that we're living in now uh, to be intentional with raising the conversation around the black experiences specifically for a male. And that is why I thought it was important for us in San Antonio to identify men uh, from varied backgrounds to share their story. For far too long, they've been marginalized and uh, placed in narrow pathways, specifically through athletics and entertainment. And uh, on the other hand, if you hear the story of the black man, it's, it's typically associated with incarceration. And I'm here to share, like many others, uh, a different story, a more clear story, a more hopeful story. So I'm a first generation Texan. My parents uh, settled here in 1978. I have an older sister who was born in 1981, and shortly thereafter I was born in 1984. We grew up in a lower middle class community uh, on the northeast side of town. At the time, that was the up and coming area for those that uh, were in the military or supporting the military. Both of my parents at the time uh, were in civilian capacity, so naturally they were assigned to an area close to Randolph and Fort Sam Houston. You know, my, my upbringing was beautiful in the sense that uh, my neighbors were white, um, the neighbors adjacent to us were Hispanic, and so I never really saw uh, racism until I got a little bit older. So I was grateful for the intentionality of my parents in terms of who they associated with personally and who my sister and I benefited from because of those relationships. So my friends uh, were a culmination and a true reflection of the American dream. So there was a time uh, when I was in seventh grade that this became crystal clear that members of this society viewed me different. It was a time when I was no longer uh, recognized for uh, my academic excellence in the classroom or uh, my skill set uh, physically in, uh, in sports. It was a time where I had to do some self-reflection to understand what this individual meant when he called me by a particular name. And it was, I remember this like it was yesterday. Uh, me and my friend uh, had been dropped off uh, to enjoy a middle school track meet at Blossom Athletic Center, the very school district that I had uh, contributed and shared my time and talents with. As the uh, meet came to a conclusion, uh, my friend got a call from his mother and stated that she was running a bit late. As she was a school teacher in SAISD, uh, she was responsible for students after school, which caused her to run a bit behind. So we were probably 30 to 45 minutes after everyone had, had left. And it was me, uh, my friend, and a police officer. We were sitting on the curb waiting to get picked up. Uh, we had to make a call via payphone. Uh, back in the days, we did not have a cell phone. Uh, we had a pager, which was the indicator to return a phone call. So as we're sitting there, uh, the sun begins to set, and the officer comes up to us and asks us what we're doing. And I articulated that we were waiting on my friend's mother uh, to pick us up, and she was just a few minutes away. And life really changed in that moment. Um, I didn't expect this response, but he said, you niggers need to go home. And that was the moment that I realized there was much more to my story that I didn't know about. And it caused me to internalize the pain, uh, but outwardly to really focus on what does it mean to be a black person? Why does my skin have to create such differentiation on treatment? And that was the point where I realized uh, something was uniquely different about me from the eyes of a non-black person. 
Seymour Battle, 48 years old, Vice President of Accounting Systems at Valero Energy Corporation. Junior high was probably the first, um, would probably be the first times. Uh, and, and, and because junior high presented the, the, the environment where now you're in extracurricular activities outside the walls of the school. Uh, I, was, I was a member of the band. Uh, I played, you know, you know, whether it's marching, concert, and, I, and so I was uh, very much, and that took us to a lot of places. And I had a, you know, we had a um, instructor who was, you know, Dr. Holly was, was very, <laughs> Again, was was very instrumental in and in, and in, uh, in, in, in channeling some of my uh, some of my extra energy. But in the band right now, so we served in uh, concert band, which took us to a lot of unconventional places to perform uh, that a lot of us as black students normally wouldn't have gone. Competitions at, at places, and so as we would travel around, not just locally, but you know statewide to to either perform at, at certain schools or certain places, whether it be marching or concert band. Um, that's when you got your real, your first in your face uh, exposure to racism. Uh, when you would go to areas that were predominantly white or white schools uh, and the, the, um, with, our, with our program being predominantly black, uh, you, would, you would see that up front, right? Uh, less welcoming. Um, you know, almost to a, you know, obvious. And so that was, that was really, you know, kind of the first things where you were told to, hey, after the performance, we're getting right back on the bus, right? We're going, we're going home right away where most programs, they, they would linger and, and enjoy things and, and enjoy the environment that they're in and go out to dinner in, in, in those towns. Uh, our instructions were back on the bus, we're going back to school. Uh, and, 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 you know, you realize then that, okay, there's something different we're having to do something very different than the rest of the programs, and it's because of where we're from, right? And then just the times, right? It was we were in areas that either the the the, the faculty or the the uh, you know the educators felt that were unsafe for us, uh, and was not best that we engage in those. And so that's again, um, that was life growing up in Mississippi, right? That was not just that that was not just isolated to activities that, with you know band and things like that. That was that was. It was an always an, a known growing up, um, but that was probably the first and kind of a structured environment where I first got the exposure uh, in that environment. As a matter of fact, I was five minutes from Clinton, you know, 30 minutes from Sitter Sitter Jackson, right? So, um, you know, there were, the, I, I remember as a kid times of, of um, unrest were seeing, seeing, um, you know, protesters, or, and we weren't protesters, but seeing, uh, you know, my first exposure to seeing people in sheets, right? This is, you know, as a kid, not fully, no, no full appreciation for what it is because of the area we're in, but it was, uh, you know, those things, um, you know, and those things um, rang true to me, not because of my fear, um, but I saw in my parents the concern. Right, so as a kid, you see the concern. Right? You, you know, we're concerned. I'm a kid. I, I, there's a natural propensity to be worried about things like that. But to see your parents, right, your protectors, your uh, to see the fear and concern um, in them does something different. Not as a kid, not having full understanding of real the real history, right? And you just knew that I just knew that hey, that was stay away, right? Don't be in the, you know not having a real appreciation of the threat at you know what had happened in the past, any you know the history around um, you know uh, the KKK and then just just civil rights movement and things that had happened. Uh, and, and that it, it, in some cases, had led to the demise of people, right? Just not having a full appreciation at, at that time. So I, I had an appreciation that we represented the threat, but not to the degree that um, <laughs> I do today as an adult, right? With a better understanding of history, a uh, better understanding of, of, of historical events uh, in and around the South uh, and, and, and just across the country as a whole.